Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Some pastors dread it when this uh, reading comes up. <laughs> I kind of revel in it because I, I really like it. Um, to tell you the truth, I consider myself somewhat dense. I need things to be spelled out very simply for me because I don't get it. Like, I know some pastors and some of my very close friends and some of my mentors are able to finesse their words. They're able to imply things without saying them and people get it. I've never been good at that. I, could, I can't get it from other people very well and I'm definitely not one of those people that can do it very well. Uh, most of the time I'm saying exactly what I mean and, um, and I'm trying to get from other people exactly what, what they mean, at least what they say. I like things spelled out. Tell me what I need to do. Tell me what I need to believe. Tell me how I'm supposed to live. Let me know what the rules are so I could live by those rules. Just tell me. And here, in chapter 25 of Matthew, it is stark. This is what you have to do. Now, chapter 25 has three um, sections to it. Um, the last two weeks we heard two parables, and uh, I explained in parables how um, it's not an allegory, it's not a metaphor. A parable is trying to teach some abstract concept using some concrete examples, but it's the abstract, concre uh, abstract uh, concept that we're to, to cling on to, not the examples, not the allegory, not the metaphor. There is no parable here. This is straightforward. When the end comes, it's going to be like this. This is what's going to happen. The king's going to sit on his throne and he's going to say, you guys go to the left, you guys go to the right. This is how it's going to be. You're going to be like, like the sheep and you're going to be like the goats. Sorry, that's just how it is. This is how it is. I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was naked, I was sick, I was imprisoned, I was a stranger. You helped me, you guys didn't help me, here it goes. You guys go here, you guys go there, that's what it is. It's so stark, it's so telling, and it's so convicting of us. It convicts us. Nobody can read this list and say, oh, I did a good job with that, I did a great job with that, I did a good job with that, and I, oh yeah, I'm good. I'm going into eternal life, this is wonderful. As a matter of fact, in our confession and forgiveness at the very beginning of this worship service, we said these things. We have failed to do these things. We failed to do them because we knew we were doing them, and we failed to do them because we didn't realize we were doing them. The things we did, the things we failed to do. Through our own uh, understanding and also our own ignorance. As a matter of fact, the, the goats here in this, in this teaching are completely ignorant. What? You were hungry? Well, I don't understand. Where, where were you? We didn't see this. No, you did. You did. You had everything you needed and you chose to be ignorant of it. That's why it's convicting. It's also difficult because this teaching is also very stark about um, what happens when we're convicted. What happens when, um, when we don't uh, live the way that we're supposed to live? The eternal punishment, the weeping, the gnashing of teeth, the eternal fire that's prepared for the devil and all his demons. That, this is what's going to happen. Hell. Hell. We don't talk about hell that much, right? Do you believe in hell? Do you believe in hell? We don't talk about it. Um, sometimes I see this, uh, this meme on Facebook. Um, it says something about, if you need the threat of hell to be a good person, you aren't a good person. You're just a bad person on a leash. Ouch. If you need the threat of hell to be a good person, then you aren't a good person. Are we good people? Now, um, we do have this concept in um, uh, our relationship with God, our theology, our understanding. It's called predestination. And basically, it works like this. Um, some people are destined, their, their fate 
Their destiny is um, to be saved, to be those that are among the elect. And then there are some that are predestined to not be. You know, everybody that's not uh, predestined to be the elect are, are predestined to be the not be, right? Now, there's another concept that builds on this, and the Calvinist uh, Reformed theology uh, kind of fleshes this out in a way that um, uh, I, one day I would like to fully study, but it's the idea of double predestination. And double predestination says that if you're predestined to be the elect, there's stuff that you could do to affect that. Like, you could, you, could, um, you could do stuff in your life, you could believe stuff in your life that, makes, that moves you from one group to the other, and likewise, from, from this group over to that group, depending on how we live our lives. If we live as one that is elected, that, that, that is predestined, then we will indeed have that destiny fulfilled. We can, we can affect our destiny. Double predestination says you can't affect that destiny no matter what. As a matter of fact, you could live as wonderfully as you want, but if you're predestined to go the other direction, you're going to go the other direction. That's just how it is. And likewise, no matter how good you are, you can never be part of the elect because you are predestined to go to hell. A goat can't change. They're a goat. They are a goat. A sheep is a sheep is a sheep. Born a goat, stay a goat. Born a sheep, stay a sheep. And the marks of a sheep are, well, one of the things in theology, that a mark of being a sheep is, well, you go to church. A mark of a sheep is that you live a certain way. That's kind of like the mark of being a sheep. Um, but it's not necessary to be in one group or uh, another. Now, it's been suggested that um, instead of these ideas of destination, predestination, double predestination, is... Um, is the idea that what hell truly is, which is like a separation of um, us from God. A separation, not just from each other as sheep and goats, but more like the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Uh, remember, the, the rich man and Lazarus both die, and, um, and uh, Lazarus goes off to heaven to be in the bosom of Abraham, and the rich man goes to hell, and there's a cavern that's, uh, that's uh, fixed between them, and it can't be crossed no matter what. And that's, that's what hell is, that, that cavern, that, that separation from God that we can never reach. And you know, it's funny, as I was thinking about this this week, man, that really feels like this life, doesn't it? I mean, sometimes it feels like there's just this cavern between us and the grace and glory of God. Sometimes it feels like this life can be hell. And for certain people in, in life, they definitely feel like their life is pure hell all the time. I'm thinking of the people in, 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 uh, in Gaza and in Israel right now. I'm thinking of people in Ukraine. I'm thinking of people all around the world that live in hunger and thirst, who are strangers being treated certain ways, people who are sick and not, not being visited, and people who are in prison and, uh, and shut away as if nobody cares about them anymore, whether they did what they were convicted of or not. Now, there's... There's a certain aspect of hell on earth right now. And, and sometimes we can even feel that in our lives, whether we have enough to eat or not, that sometimes we can feel like we are hungry, spiritually hungry. And then there's the story of, um, uh, uh, of the atheist that's talking to the... Um, uh, the person that believes in God. And um, so, so tell me, um, so, so what does God desire of us? Well, God desires that we love him, okay? And what happens if we don't love God? Well, then he, he sends you to hell. It's like, well, that's not very loving. You know, the loving God that, that would treat anybody like that, like, like, love me or else. You know, that's a toxic relationship. Is that our relationship with God? Love me or else? Love people or else? Again, it's convicting of us and our understanding of even who God is. Now, this teaching in Matthew seems to suggest that we have some effect on um, our salvation. It, it, it seems to suggest that, um, that if you do the right things, then everything will be fine. Um, and um, as I pointed out, there's not 
one of us who I think can sit here and read through this list and think that we're doing an okay job on this. So here's a little disclaimer. Um, I'm not going to be revealing any shocking secrets to anybody, but um, I, I um, and here's another, uh, another thing, I, I take pride in the fact that I understand that I am a sinner. <laughs> you know, it, and that in itself is a sin. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm the same as all of you. I'm, I make mistakes, sometimes on purpose, sometimes not on purpose. Uh, sometimes I'm willfully ignorant, and sometimes I'm just ignorant because I, I am. Um, I, I live the exact same uh, uh, struggle as anybody else, even knowing the things that I know. As a matter of fact, at my core, guess what? It's going to be shocking for the lifelong Lutherans here. At my core, I believe in works righteousness. At my core, I believe that I have to live a better life. I have to live a good life, otherwise God won't love me. At my core, I'm like, man, I look at my life and it's not very good and God probably doesn't love me and that's why my life is the way that it is. And my head screams to my core saying, no, no, beloved child, that is why Jesus Christ, that is why Jesus came, to help you, to show you there's another way that we can't work our own way into heaven, that there's only one way and one truth and one life, and that is Jesus Christ. Scripture, as a matter of fact, teaches us that we are not saved by our own works. Even after this teaching, immediately after this teaching, Jesus does the thing that will save us all. After this teaching in Matthew 25, then begins his passion narrative. How all of Jesus' friends, all of Jesus' righteous friends, abandon him, deny him, betray him, and leave him alone, dying on a cross. Scripture teaches us that we are not saved by our own works, but by that work of Jesus Christ. And thank God, no, literally, thank God that Jesus did that for us. Now, um, there's an argument that I've had with my uh, seminary classmates and uh, and even other pastors about... um, about the idea of um, what salvation actually means. Because a lot of times we say salvation is, um, uh, is um, uh, assured and therefore um, there's nothing we need to do in order to worry about salvation and therefore it's all done with and then we live our lives. As a matter of fact, um, Martin Luther had a lot of discussions with um, the Catholic theologians uh, about uh, this idea that if no one has to do anything uh, to be saved, then they won't do anything. And that's a great point, isn't it? If you don't have to do anything to be saved, then, then why? Why go to church? Why, why feed the hungry? Why give drink to the thirsty? Why welcome the stranger? You're saved. You don't have to worry about it. And the answer is, because it's expected of us. As a matter of fact, it's an obligation that we're given. When we're saved, it's the starting point for how we're supposed to live our lives. It's not the ending point. Salvation isn't something for us to achieve. Salvation was achieved 2,000 years ago on the cross, and now we have an obligation of how we're going to live our lives moving forward. We have an obligation to do these things. An obligation What is an obligation? It's an act or course of action to which a person is morally or legally bound. That is what an obligation is. A duty or commitment. That's the dictionary definition of obligation. Now, it's it's hard to define morals lately, though, isn't it? What is morally just? It's hard to define these things. Or duty. It's hard to define what a duty, what duty is, or even what commitment is. What is commitment these days? Even marriage isn't the commitment it used to be. It's that tipping point, right? 50% of couples that are married get divorced. How did we get there? What is 
What is commitment to a society that doesn't even view that as, as something to hold on to? It's hard for us to define what morals, duty, commitment, obligation is for us. These have all become subjective, fluid things, things that change with the situation, open for interpretation. And that's where a problem in Scripture comes around. Plenty of pastors will be able to define this list that Jesus, get, that Jesus gives in this teaching and say, well, this is what it actually means to be hungry. Well, this is actually what it means to be in prison. Well, this is actually what it means to be a stranger. Jesus is saying the words. He's not mixing what it means. The hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the imprisoned, the sick. These are who they are. You can't get around who these are, who your neighbor is. As Jesus says, any of the sisters or brothers are. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament scriptures and in, in the teachings, there's the orphan, the widow, and the stranger. Again and again and again, these three people come up. This is how you're supposed to live your life, God says to the Israelites. And you're supposed to bless the orphan, the widow, and the stranger. The orphan, the widow, and the stranger. You're supposed to take care of them. You're supposed to give them food off your plate. You're supposed to help them. They are the least in the society, those that don't have family, that don't have a place to live, that don't have any kind of help whatsoever. Again and again, 80 to 100 times, it's mentioned in Scripture, the orphan, the widow, and the stranger. Yet we get obsessed with one or two things that are offhanded comments in the book of Leviticus in order to hate people. Eighty to a hundred times, God tells the people, love the orphan, the widow, and the stranger in your midst, and treat them with kindness and fairness and give to them and help them because they don't have anybody else to help them. In the New Testament, Jesus defined, redefines it in a different way. At first, it's love God, love your neighbor, and then he has to define who the neighbor is, love the Samaritan. And then he has to define that once again here in, in chapter 25. The hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the stranger, the sick, the imprisoned, these are the least in our society. These are the least. These are the people that you should be helping, taking from your own plate, your own closet, your own taxes, your own whatever, your own coffers of money, your own mites, and giving to them and sharing with them. You can't mince words of what this scripture means. So it begs the question, here 2,000 years later, we look around our society, who are the least? Who are the orphan, the widow, and the stranger of today in our midst? Who are the hungry and the thirsty and the naked and the imprisoned and the stranger and the sick in our midst today? Who are these? Because these are the people we're supposed to be serving, our obligation to serve them. In every age, there's a new definition of who these least and last are. And today, we argue with that and say, well, you've got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Did you know some people don't have bootstraps? As a matter of fact, some people weren't even born with boots. How can they pull themselves up? It will try to let ourselves off the hook. Well, I gave some food to the food pantry. I'm good. I don't need to visit the imprisoned because um, I saw someone thirsty and I gave them a bottle of water out of the trunk of my car. No, it's this whole list. We're not to pick and choose who we help. We're supposed to love the least in society. It's hard enough to talk about feeding the hungry, but welcoming the stranger, refugee crisis, it's all around the world. Do we welcome the stranger? What does that look like? How can we honestly feel ourselves good about how we treat the stranger in our midst. 
It's a harder conversation to have, isn't it? It doesn't make us feel very good. Maybe that's why Jesus uses this kind of uh, wording here. Believe, help, or else. Ouch. What if Jesus were to stand here today and say, maybe instead of making those people that speak Spanish learn English, maybe you should learn Spanish. What if Jesus were standing here saying that? Ouch. Welcoming the stranger, what does that mean? It's in scripture. I'm not being political. I'm trying to exegete this text. And I just, I just revealed to you that I'm as convicted as any of you are of failing in these things. Yet it's still our obligation to help. It's still our obligation to do these things. And our ignorance isn't an excuse. So going back to the beginning of the question of hell, what kind of hell do you believe in? Is it the type to keep us in line so that we do a better job? Is it the type of, um, uh, of separation from God that we create our own hell on earth in the way that we treat each other? Or if our lives stop being defined by salvation, but how we live that salvation out, how can instead of creating a hell on earth, how can we start creating a heaven on earth where all people are loved, no matter what their situation, no matter what has happened in their life, no matter where they found themselves when they were born, whether they were wearing boots or not, helping those people, loving those people, and creating a heaven on earth. Now, I also want to say <clears throat> that in, um, I actually, I think it's part of 12-step programs, but I also think it's, um, it's part of um, uh, programs that teach people how to, um, to, to get along with others. It's actually, um, there's this great line. It says, you aren't responsible for your first thought. You aren't responsible for your first thought because that's about conditioning. That's about how you were raised. That's about the voices that you've been told all your life. That's about the influences in your life. That's about your situation. You're not responsible for your first thought. You are responsible for your second thought and your first action. And that's what I think this scripture means. You aren't responsible for your first thought because we're sinners through and through. But then we're responsible for remembering we are saved by the grace of God and therefore we should move into that action of feeding, of giving drink, of visiting, clothing, loving. And then we can start living as those saved by grace through faith. And that won't serve to separate ourselves from others, but join together and create that heaven here on earth. Amen.